let me introduce our speaker today. So, Professor Emeritus Geoffrey Cordell obtained his PhD in indo acolyte Chemistry at the University of Manchester in 1970. And after two years at MIT, joined the College of Pharmacy, University of Illinois in Chicago. And he has um, had whole several administrative positions at, at the college until he retired in 2007. He is an author of about uh, 600 research publications, uh, 37 books, and uh, also a number of volumes in the alkaloid chemistry and biology. He has been an editor, uh, editor board of international journals, and presently assisting government and university in the development of traditional medicine and their administrative, uh, administrative and research resources. And of course, I believe very popular in countries like Japan, Thailand, Mexico, Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. So <laughs> without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Cordell to give his lecture. Please welcome. Okay. So I need to, can you turn on this share? Okay, can, can you see this okay? Yes. Okay, and you're hearing me okay? I am. Good. All right, then let's begin. First of all, good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for um, allowing me to do this webinar. It's a great honor and a great thrill to be uh, with you in, um, in wherever you are. And I don't know where everybody is who's on this call at the moment, but wherever you are, I wish you well. And um, safe and healthy environment. Um, these are very challenging times for, for everybody. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is um, a different view of pharmacognosy probably than you um, have experienced. Um, I wanted to talk, as, just, as the uh, title says, about contemporary pharmacognosy in society, a little bit on the present um, and also looking to the future. Um, because most of you on this call are, are just beginning out your careers in pharmacy and learning about pharmacognosy, learning about what it is, and you're going to be practicing various aspects of pharmacognosy for a, for a long time, and I want to try to give you an idea of how that's going to um, be impactful for you. Um, so one of my goals then is to, is to give you an idea about the implications of pharmacognosy for the, for the future. And you'll see in the middle of this, of this first slide here some of the implications that, that pharmacognosy and, and health sciences generally are running up against. We're running up against the major impact of climate change, um, of, of issues related to global health, of species disappearing, um, of uh, various new diseases, and of course we've had the classic one of COVID in the last year. We're looking at rising sea levels in various parts of the world versus desertification in other parts of the world. And, and many of these aspects will have an impact on pharmacognosy. And so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the implications of, of, of those impacts. So natural products matter. Um, they matter and they matter forever in terms of, of human existence, in terms of shelter, in terms of food. Um, They've been, de been developed by humans in terms of the, the resins, the gums and the waxes, uh, flavoring agents and spices. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on. Perfumes and cosmetics, um, which are also part of, of uh, pharmacognosy as well. Prescription and over-the-counter pharmaceuticals, which are quite familiar to you, I'm sure, in, in many different aspects. Traditional medicines, which are an important part of, of what most of the world deals with in terms of uh, pharmacognosy on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got herbicides and insecticides, and of course there's great interest now in broadening the impact of natural herbicides and natural insecticides. Um, you're probably very familiar with a, um, a mixture of, of, of uh, materials coming from neem, from the neem tree, that's used as an insecticide. And we've also got what I call the dark side of pharmacognosy, which is some aspects of the substances of abuse. So today we're going to cover a wide range of topics, very wide range. 
And um, we're going to just skip over them. We're not going to go into great detail, as many of these are, are one-hour lectures in and of themselves. So we've got a very brief amount of time, so we're going to be going quite fast. Uh, so buckle up your seatbelts and, and let's go. Now, if we're going to talk about research on any of these product groups, such as flavoring agents or traditional medicines, they've all got their individual challenges. And, and in terms of one aspect of this, drug discovery, we're going to mention some particular challenges that, that lie there and some opportunities that lie there. So what is pharmacognosy today? <clears throat> well, it's, it's partly the classical pharmacognosy. The classical pharmacognosy was organism identification. It was focused on the macro and the micro um, determinations, sometimes with a chemical um, assay thrown in, um, that would identify the plant material. Now that's more focused on DNA um, basing, usually um, an ITS2. Um, system that, that will identify the plant and, and there are databases that are available for that purpose. Pharmacognosy is very interested in the structures of the compounds, of the biological activity of the compounds and the biosynthesis of those biologically active compounds. So rather than, rather than just being focused on organism, it's broadened. And as we're going to see, it keeps on broadening. It got into drug discovery from plants, microbes, and marine organisms. So it goes beyond the plant materials. It goes into other sources of biologically active compounds, like microbes, bacteria, fungi, etc., and the marine organism systems, and all of those that are available. It looks also at quality control issues of biologically active natural products. So that includes prescription products, the OTCs, traditional medicines, dietary supplements, and the cosmetics. We'll see why that is in just a moment. What else is it? It's also about the integration of new technologies and data systems. I regard pharmacognosy as the high-tech pharmaceutical science, because all of those new technologies, and we're going to touch on a couple of them today, not many of them, but a couple of them, um, all of those come into pharmacognosy. And particularly, the focus now is on the integration of those new technologies with data systems, with data systems, including various forms of um, AI. So artificial intelligence is now an important part of, of pharmacognosy. Identification of natural toxins in foods and the environment. So if you're looking for aflatoxins that are present in various foodstuffs that are rotting, or environmental toxins, whether those are plant materials themselves or whether they're marine organisms like red tides or um, um, systems that, that, that exist to, that harm shellfish and um, harm uh, shrimp farms and fish farms, those kinds of things are all aspects of pharmacognosy as well. That's more of an environmental application than a pharmaceutical application, obviously. We're going to look at illegal natural drugs because that, that's an important aspect that, that deserves some very special attention. So we'll have some special comments on that. And then there is this dark side, this trade in threatened and endangered species that we need to really, really get a handle on if we're going to be responsible pharmacognosists. But there's a couple of things that are missing from that list, aren't there? What are they? Well, one of them is sustainability. Sustainability. And the other is climate change. Because both of those aspects, sustainability and climate change, have a dramatic impact on the availability of those natural resources and the quality of those natural resources. In other words, the chemistry is going to change with climate. So for example, a plant will have a different chemical profile if it's grown in a different soil, if it's grown under different um, weather environment conditions. So for example, heat, humidity, hot, cold, dry, wet, all of those are going to change the chemical profile. 
If you change the chemical profile, you change the biology. If you change the biology, you change the effectiveness of the plant, the effectiveness of the traditional medicine. Without the natural resources, in other words, if those resources are not sustainable, then you don't have a system. So once the plants start to disappear, particularly those plants that are used in traditional medicines, you've lost that ability for a practitioner to prescribe them. So it becomes very important that we think in terms of sustainability. And Several years ago, about nine years ago, I came up with a new word. And that new word is eco-pharmacognosy. And the eco part was to bring in this notion of studying sustainable, biologically active natural resources. So the original definition of pharmacognosy is the study of biologically active natural resources. And notice that it doesn't give an indication of the source. So it could be marine, it could be plant, it could be fungal, it could be bacterial, it could be human. It could be human. But the issue now for eco-pharmacognosy is that it's sustainable. So we'll mention a little bit of that more in the maybe more in the question section. Well, we know that based on what's been happening in the last ten months, twelve months now almost with, with COVID, that we no longer have a healthy planet. Um, but but that, there are many different aspects of that healthy planet concept. One of them is the anthropogenic aspect, which is what we as humans are doing to the planet. We have about 7.84 billion people on planet at the moment, and they're having an incredible impact based on the extensive growth that's occurred in population in the last 30 or 40 years. One of those, of course, and you see it certainly around the campus where you are at UITM, um, tremendous changes in the biodiversity, in the habitat loss, in, in changing the environment, changing the landscape, loss of the forest, turning it in, into places where people can live. So habitat and biodiversity loss is enormous in many, many different parts of the world. And, and for example, if you, if you look at the history of Borneo in the last 50 years and you, and you look at the biodiversity there, tremendous differences. If we think in terms of climate change, we've got, certainly in the United States, we've had tremendous issues in California and where there's been um, drought um, with forests that are just tinderboxes and, and catch fire very easily and spread very rapidly. We've got drought in many areas of the world. There are, no going to, there are not going to be medicinal plants growing in a, in a drought environment like that. And then you've got the destruction from the hurricanes and the cyclones and the typhoons that are hitting various parts of the world. So another one of the mitigating factors in all of this is the question of time. It's a question of time that we're running out of time to act, time to stop talking, but really act and be serious about that. In addition, we've got what I call a global health care gap. And the global health care gap is in, takes many different forms. But two of the most important forms are that pharmaceutical companies don't do research on tropical diseases. So they're not doing drug discovery looking for a new um, treatment for dengue or even malaria. Um, or schistosomiasis, or filariasis, or some of the major tropical diseases of the world. There's also an issue, a, a healthcare gap, in terms of cost. In other words, the cost of a particular drug in the emerging world versus in the developed world, and the availability of that drug. So we can put it this way. Traditional medicines, as we'll see in a moment, cannot be developed as full-scale drugs. Right? That, that, that's typically not going to happen. And one of the reasons why that's not going to happen is because it's too expensive and because the facilities, the systems that are needed in a country in order to be able to do that are not present. There are very few countries in the world which have a full 
pharmaceutical system that can go from drug discovery right through to drug production and, and delivery. And, and again, that's another topic we can talk about. On the other hand, the synthetic drugs cannot meet healthcare demands because of the volume, the sheer volume. There's very few drugs that will meet global healthcare demands. Aspirin would be one of them, of course. Um, ibuprofen would be another. Um, but there are many drugs that are very important in certain developed countries, but just simply can't be made on a large enough scale to be developed in the rest of the world. Which produces a very significant challenge for countries. Because the issue then becomes, well, how do you balance importing allopathic drugs, developing a pharmaceutical industry, doing generic substitution from drugs that may be coming from another country or locally, depending on the status of your pharmaceutical industry, and providing safe and effective traditional medicines, which is what a lot of people in many emerging countries around the world rely on. But you have to do that in a sustainable and an affordable manner. Now, that whole issue in and of itself is, is a major, major confrontational issue in many countries. And, and, and we can talk about it maybe in another lecture some other time about how to do that. I'm going to talk about just some preliminary aspects of that. But first, let's, let's just look that in, in, in this period from 1981 to 2019, these are the natural products that were, were approved as drugs, as prescription drugs in the United States. And they represent about 25% of all the drugs. So these are various forms of synthetic drugs. These are biologicals and these are natural products. So they still have a very important role to play in drug discovery and drug approval processes. So what are the goals of drug discovery? Well, because most drug discovery is done in either small or larger um, drug companies, pharmaceutical companies, they want to protect their investment. The way they protect their investment is through patents. And the compounds that are most patentable are the compounds that are going to be new and that they, where there is a new biological activity. Another possibility is with a known compound which, is, um, which has a new biological activity. And that's called the repurposing of drugs, the repurposing of drugs. Because you take a compound that's already known and approved and then use it in a new way. You devise a new way. You discover a new way. So what aspect of drug discovery that's going on now is to look at these known compounds that are already approved, and they're approved because of their safety issues, and then those go into various biological tests looking for new possibilities for patenting. What's not going to be patentable is a compound that's known, and a compound that has a known biological activity. So one of the challenges in drug discovery is to get rid of these compounds from that drug discovery process. And, and again, that's a major issue. It's called dereplication. And we can talk about that in another place and time. So what are the natural product drug discovery sources that we, that we talk about? Well, we've got bacteria and fungi. We've got the plants. And we've got marine sources. So any one of these materials, any one of these natural organisms, come under the rubric of pharmacognosy from a drug discovery perspective. What's important is that the strategies the strategies for doing drug discovery from all of these resources is very different. Ultimately, it comes down to the same thing, finding a biologically active compound from the extract of one of these materials. However, the way you get to that extract, the way you get to 
what is important. The way you get to that biological activity is quite different in those particular cases. So if we focus on plants, just for a moment here, if we focus on the plants, one of the challenges from an eco-pharmacognosy perspective is what parts of plants are, going to, are we going to be interested in. We're going to be interested in the plant parts that are sustainable. So typically that's not going to be a root, and it's not going to be a bark. It's not going to be a root, it's not going to be a bark. It's going to be a renewable resource. That might be a fruit, it might be a leaf, it might be a flower, it might be a stem. We're typically, because of the Convention on Biological Diversity, we're typically going to have to get permission. If you want to go out into the field, into the forest, you need permission in order to do that. You can't just do that. You can't just go into the forest and take plants. That's not allowed. All the countries in the world, except for three, which we don't need to go into, all those countries have in fact agreed that there will be criteria and permissions needed in order to do plant collection in the field. You don't have to get those plants identified. And we've said we're going to do macro, micro, and DNA identification of plants. And we usually do that through some major herbarium. This happens to be the Field Museum in Chicago, which is one of the major herbariums in, in the world. So how do we get our plants? What's the basis for getting those plants? What, what's the drug discovery pathway? So typically, we have two choices. One of them is to use traditional medicine, to use that ethnomedical information. Those, those years, hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years even, of ethnomedical information which gives us some idea as to which plants may have certain types of activity. That information may come from journals, such as Journal of Ethnopharmacology, which does a lot of survey work, publishes a lot of surveys on plants that are active. Or it may come from a healer, such as this medicine man. I, I took his uh, photograph in, in Morocco. Um, and so here he is with all his, his herbal medicines. And, and he, could, he could give you a whole history of which, which herbal medicines are used for what purpose. And then there's a step of, of information analysis, which we'll come back to in just a moment. The other approach is to just do random screening of one form or another, just to say, oh, we're going to collect plants randomly from a forest, or we're going to collect plants in a certain family, or we're going to collect plants which will give certain types of compound, for example, a particular type of alkaloid or a particular type of terpene derivative, or flavonoids, or some particular class of natural product that we're seeking. Either way, we're going to have to prioritize our collections. We're going to have to look at how we do the extraction. What are the techniques we're going to use? And what are the bioassays that we're going to use? And how many of those bioassays? Do we use one? Do we use two? Do we use ten? Are they cell-based? Are they mechanism-based? Are they receptor-based, enzyme-based? So all of these become important decision-making processes in the discovery of bioactive compounds from plants. So I want to look now, though, at, at some other ecopharmacognosy aspects of both drug discovery and the synthesis of chemical compounds and the modification of natural products. <clears throat> so one of them is the approach of green mining. Green mining. Because we're thinking green here. Eco, sustainable, green. So it's not this type of mining that we're, we're talking about. This is a, obviously a Pit. I think it's for I think it's a silver mine somewhere in Africa. We're talking about this kind of mining. We're talking about data mining of genomes. And what we're looking at is the genomic data for bacteria and fungi and plants and humans looking for 
systems, for gene systems that are capable of producing natural products. And particularly what we're looking for are those that, that produce natural products that we don't recognize. That's where the data mining comes in, because there's so much known now about the systems, the genomic systems, which do produce those compounds, that we can eliminate those and say, well, this one produces a penicillin. We don't need to go there. We know about penicillin. Ah, but this one, we don't know what that produces. Let's try to produce the enzymes from that gene system, that gene cluster, and produce it and look at the compounds. That's a discovery process. We can do in silico studies. In silico means that everything is done with a computer. Whether that's looking, whether that's having the, the, the enzyme system, the enzyme that's involved in a particular system, and we'll see an example in a moment. And we're looking to, to fit a compound in a receptor site. And we're looking at the best match. And we're looking at the energies. And that involves supercomputing technologies that will look at the various conformations and the fits of a compound in a, an active site in an enzyme. That's green mining. There's no solvents involved. There's no lab involved. There's a computer involved hooked up to a supercomputer somewhere. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. We're looking at spectral and other analytical data because we're looking for new compounds. So, for example, when we do spectral data, and I don't want to go into the details today, but when we look at large sets of spectral data from an extract, one of the challenges is to be able to use artificial intelligence to look for new compounds, to look for new mass, masses that haven't been discovered before, fragmentation pathways of compounds that haven't been discovered before. Those are the new challenges. Those are, that's where the frontier is in the use of artificial intelligence for pharmacognosy. And we can look at the ethnobotanical data and the biological data. So if we look at those large data sets, what we're looking for is if we look at ethnobotanical data for a particular plant, if we look at those data for Malaysia versus Thailand versus Indonesia versus Vietnam versus China, they're going to be different. But what we can do is we can correlate the information that comes from the ethnobotanical information with the biological information where the tests have been done. So we can match it. And we can see where the gaps are. And we can say, well, OK, this, this particular plant has been used for pain, let's say, in Malaysia. But there's no compound from it that will be identified as having some form of analgesic activity. That means that's a research opportunity. That means you can collect that plant, go and look for, for the analgesic compound, if it's there, that would support the ethnobotanical information. So it's another way to do drug discovery. And what we're looking at is as many different green approaches that we can come up with. Here's an example of what I was just talking about. This, this happens to be an alkaloid. It's a, it happens to be a bisisoquinoline alkaloid, seferanthine. This is the structure of seferanthine. And it looks at the match between this particular compound and the um, trypanosome reductase inhibitor, TYRR. Look, it's looking for that inhibitor and seeing how it matches in the active site of this particular enzyme. Because if it hits in the active site, it's going to be an inhibitor. And that's what we're looking for. So this work was done in silico with a supercomputer. It was done a few years ago in silico. And it's a way in which we can match compounds with receptor sites, looking for inhibition of that enzyme through specific binding algorithms. Synthesis. So these are sustainable reagents 
for carbonyl group reduction. Guess what? They're cheap. Carrots, sugarcane juice, cassava, coconut. Guess what? They're environmentally safe. Those of you who know a little bit of organic chemistry will know that if you try to do a high yield in angioselective reduction of a carbonyl group, will know that it takes a chiral lithium hydride reagent or a uh, platinum or ruthenium reagent that has some kind of chiral adjuvant. This works. It's high yield, 96%, 98%. Very high in antimeric excess, very high chirality. Atom economy. There's no waste here. High energy efficiency. You can use these systems. The cassava system, we've used that six, seven times with same high energy efficiency. So they're reusable catalysts, reusable catalysts. You don't just use them once and throw them away. Keep on reusing them. Tremendous potential here. This, again, is pharmacognosy. It's another aspect of pharmacognosy. It's a green aspect of looking for chemical systems in nature that would be biologically active, that would produce, and chemically active. <clears throat> There's another drug discovery opportunity that relies in foods and medicines. So, for example, if we look at turmeric, turmeric is now being sold all over the world for various claims. We don't discuss the validity of the claims, but various claims, and it's based on a spice that, that you know, you all use in terms of curries. I used some the other day when I made a curry. Use ginger. I used ginger the other day. Here we are again. We're using ginger in our foods, but it's also being used as a medicine, as a dietary supplement. Cinnamon. We know that cinnamon it's, again, a very powerful spice used in a lot of different foods. Those of you who love cinnamon uh, buns or, or various other forms of cinnamon cakes and one thing and another. But we also know that cinnamon is very important in lowering blood sugar. So it's being sold for that purpose. Let's look at a couple of others. Black pepper being used for detoxification. Garlic being used in terms of, of lowering cholesterol. And we know that that's widely used. In almost every food you ever eat, there's a little bit of garlic in there. So what's the relationship here? Does it help? Is it valid? That's, that's a whole other aspect of pharmacognosy which needs tremendous amount of, of Research effort. Yes, there's a lot of information out there, but the active principles of garlic, as far as I know, are not well characterized. Oregano is another more recent one, um, coming from uh, the Mediterranean region, um, that's now being used. And again, it's a very traditional spice in a lot of lot of uh, lot of foods or in many different parts of the world. So here again, we've got opportunities in terms of drug discovery. If the question is, which ones do we want to do? How do we pursue them? One of the ones that we pursued a few years ago, and I did this with a group in, in Iran, um, was to look at caraway seeds. Actually, they're, they're the fruits, but they're often referred to as caraway seeds. And um, we found that, that they have a very, that the aqueous extract has a very strong anti-obesity effect. And so there was a clinical trial done, and that was published, as you can see, a few years ago now. And um, we're following up on that as, um, at this time. But um, just to show you that that, that the validity, that it, 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 was, it was implied that the caraway seed had this activity. And um, using a standardized preparation, we were able to show that there was a, an anti-obesity effect. And then there's the dark side of ecopharmacognosy and this, this strange paradox of alkaloids. 
The dark side of ecopharmacognosy relates to the illicit harvesting of various animal species that are being lost at a dramatic level. Um, so, for example, rhino horn, the farming of, of rhino horn, which has been illegal for, for many, many years, but still goes on. And, and every now and again, you'll see in, in the Thai customs or Malaysian customs or Chinese customs that, that a new batch of rhino horn has been, has been um, um, identified and, and the people have been arrested. There's only two northern white rhinos left in the world now. Only two. And the black rhino, so-called western black rhino, is ex went extinct in 2013 because of the farming for the horn, the killing of the rhinos for the horn. Other um, medicines that are, are kind of on the edge of legality are bear gallbladder and musk oil. Well, you're dealing with materials there that are banned from commerce and are having a tremendous impact on the on the resources for them. So we need to be very careful about and monitoring the use of those materials in medicines as various products. <coughs> the paradox of alkaloids. The paradox of alkaloids really clearly really comes down to these two compounds in many ways, morphine and cocaine. Morphine, probably one of the best analgesics um, from nature and, and has been for thousands of years, and cocaine, another anesthetic. Cocaine in the coca, coca leaf, is illegal in most parts of the world, of course. And the paradox here is the health benefit the pain relief from these two compounds versus the abuse. Pain relief, health benefit versus abuse. So here we are in the poppy fields in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan produces now about 94-96% of global illicit poppy. Although Colombia and Bolivia are also producing a lot in South America. Interestingly, coca, coca leaf, not cocaine, but coca leaf is legal in Peru and Bolivia. So, for example, if you go to a market in Peru, like a traditional medicine market or even a local market, you'll see women sellers of coca leaf. And this, I took this photo in a hotel. This is coca leaf tea. And so when you're very high up in the Andes, what you do is you take coca leaf tea every morning and maybe once or twice during the day. And it helps tremendously with altitude sickness. So if you're up in Cusco, in the area of Machu Picchu, or any up of the high Andes areas, this is what you take. You take coca. You take coca leaf. And it's legal. On the other hand, Here's a cocaine submarine. A, yes, that's what I said. A cocaine submarine. This submarine has probably got $100 million worth of cocaine on it. Purified cocaine. And this is coming up the coast, the west coast of South America, from Colombia, up the west coast, to come up to the west coast of somewhere like Mexico, Guatemala, and will then be transported across into the United States or maybe into um, Europe across the Atlantic Ocean. So the interception of cocaine submarines is now a huge effort by the drug um, administrations of, of many different countries in Central and South America as well as the United States. Now I want to talk on a different topic. I want to talk on traditional medicine quality control. And I'm also including phytocosmetics in this discussion as well. I took this photo down in Medellin, Colombia. Traditional medicine seller. It's typical of what you see for traditional medicines in many, many different countries in the world. Here's this range of traditional medicines. 
sitting out there on the street. We don't know the history of them. We don't know the authenticity of them. We're relying on, we're trusting this person to be able to identify and come up with the right plant for the right disease state. In terms of phytocosmetic quality control, probably you may not have seen this. This is an Apuntia cactus. This was taken, I took this photo, this was down in Peru. And um, what's growing on here are these little bugs. And it's these little bugs that when you squeeze them and you dry the extract, the exudate, give you cochineal. And cochineal appears all over the place. It appears in some candies. It appears in some foodstuffs as a dye stuff use. And it appears in lots of cosmetics, particularly lipsticks. Um, use cochineal for, for the coloring. So this is down in, in, in Peru um, and um, in an area close to Arequipa in Peru. These are the, the farmers collecting the, the bugs, collecting the leaves and collecting the bugs. This is what it looks like when you squeeze one of those bugs. These are the compounds you get, the anthraquinone derivatives that you get from, from the extract. And obviously different bugs, it's a little hard to see here, but you could, I think you get an idea that, that these extracts from these different bugs actually have slightly different colors. So one of the things that, that has to be standardized, the quality control aspect, is how do you get all these various colorings into different color lipsticks and so on and so forth. And that's another aspect of phytocosmetics. Now, to make the advancement of traditional medicines a reality, actually, we need to deal with some myths. And I want to remind you, remind you all, that first and foremost, you are scientists. Whether you're going to become a pharmacist later on, whether you're going to become a biologist or a physician or whatever, you're a scientist. So we've got to deal with the myths that are similar to those that relate to mermaids, to werewolves. And what is this about a mandrake that's a panacea? You can look that one up. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be myth busting. We're going to be ghost busting here. And the question that you always have to ask here is, where's the scientific evidence? So let's take a look at some of these myths. This traditional medicine has been used for thousands of years. Therefore, it's safe and effective. <clears throat> is that true or is it false? It's false. It's false because we don't have the scientific evidence. Because that's not, that's not the way you test whether something is really truly safe and effective. What it is, what it is, is fantastic information. Fantastic information. Because what it's telling us is there's a possibility there. And our job is not to affirm that activity, it's to, it's, to, it's to determine, it's to evaluate, it's to assess, it's not to validate. It's not to validate, it's to make sure that we are assessing it in an unbiased manner, in unbiased test systems. Using the right plant is adequate. No, no, because a different plant part will give you a different chemistry. So, for example, if we say the constituents are always the same, no, they're not. The origin could be very different. As we've said before, a different, the same plant grown in a different environment, including altitude, including the pH of the soil, it's going to have different constituents. Different plant parts have very different constituents. A leaf from a bark, from a root, from a fruit, from a flower, completely different. And as we see in a moment, we're going to see that the mode of preparation from the plant material, whatever that plant material is, gives you a different chemical profile, which means a different biological response. Our older plant material is less effective. Well, we don't know that. It may be. Or it may be that the plant material, when it ages, and when certain compounds decompose, actually produce the biologically active material. 
Medicinal plants are safer than synthetic drugs. Maybe, maybe not. You have to do the science. You have to do the experiments. Some more myths. Wild collected plants are more active than cultivated plants. We don't know. They may be. But maybe when you cultivate the plant, you can actually produce more of the active principle or principles. If that's the case, then the cultivated plants are going to be more active. Complex mixtures of plants cannot be standardized. This used to be the case. Not anymore. Not with the current technologies. Not with the current analytical techniques. Not with the current spectroscopic techniques. Yes, they can be standardized. Very complex mixtures can be standardized. This product is well regulated. Mm, typically not. Typically, a traditional medicine, a dietary supplement, is not well regulated all around the world. In fact, it's typically poorly regulated. And as budding pharmacists, one of your challenges is going to be when a patient comes into your pharmacy and says, well, you're selling five or six different ginseng products. Which one do you recommend that I buy? Which neem product do you recommend that I use? And because they're not well regulated, you don't know what's in them. We'll come back to that. It's important. The plant will always be there. No, it won't. Not if you keep taking, taking, taking from the forest. It's going to disappear. Then what are you going to do? What are you going to use instead? So you have to have a plan. You have to have a plan for a, a plant that is being well used widely used, perhaps a commercial product that's even an export product, you have to say, well, when do we start to cultivate this? The other aspect, of course, is that traditional knowledge is always going to be there. No, it won't. The holders of the knowledge are dying off, and they're not typically passing on their knowledge to the apprentices, because there are no apprentices. So we have to get out there. We have to collect that knowledge if we want to preserve that traditional medicine, that traditional knowledge, the benefit of the information from the uses of all of those plant materials. There's also a myth in modern medicine about traditional medicine, which says this. Traditional medicines are not effective and therefore are not worth considering as part of a contemporary healthcare system. Baloney. Stop it. Wrong. No. No, 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 no. What you're looking for is developing an integrated healthcare system based on valid, appropriately standardized traditional medicines. It's not that they're not effective. No. It's that the science needs to come into traditional medicine quality control to make sure that they are effective on a standardized basis. And they have to be like coffee. They have to work. So Shu goes into the coffee shop. This was obviously before COVID because no one's wearing a mask. And Fran says, how's the coffee taste? She's concerned with her customer. Who cares how it tastes? It's my first cup of the day. The first cup doesn't have to taste, it just has to work. So how many of you in the morning will have a cup of coffee, will have a cup of tea? Same beneficial effect, caffeine. You're after the biological effect, that clinical pharmacognosy effect of a biologically active natural product in a plant material. It's a patient expectation that traditional medicines are going to work. They have to. And it should be evidence-based. So what does this coffee cartoon tell us about traditional medicines and what we need to be doing? Well, first of all, it's patient-centered. Fran is the one who asks the patient here, the customer, the consumer of the coffee, how's the coffee? And why does he go back to the coffee shop? Because it provides quality, 
processing and taste that he likes. It's safe. It's effective. Wakes him up. It's consistent. He goes back to the coffee shop every day because it's consistent. It's sustainable. Coffee is a sustainable entity around the world because, why? Because it's a cultivated crop and it's accessible. Accessible here means that not only is it available, but that it's appropriately priced. It's appropriately priced. He can afford the cup of coffee. So here's the challenge. I love M&Ms. That's a state secret, but I love M&Ms. So as I travel around the world, which I haven't been doing recently, but I typically do quite a bit of, I, I buy M&Ms. And when I buy M&Ms, I know they're going to taste the same, whether I buy them in, in Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok or Hong Kong or Beijing or, or somewhere in Europe or South America. They're going to taste the same. They're consistent. This is what a traditional medicine has to be for the patient. It has to be consistent. So I put together this acronym here, QSECA. We'll come back to it just shortly. So what are the four pillars of traditional medicine quality control? Then? Well, one, the first one is information. In other words, what information is already out there about that traditional medicine? That's data systems. That's the literature. That's accumulated information over the years from many, many different sources. It's about the botany. What are the criteria for authenticating a plant? It's about the chemistry. What are the chemical constituents? How do we analyze them? Are we dealing with flavonoids? Are we dealing with steroids? Are we dealing with alkaloids? Are we dealing with some form of terpenoid, steroid, triterpene, who knows what? Sesquiterpenes, maybe? And it's about the biology. What's the appropriate biology that relates to the proposed investigation for traditional medicine use? As let's say an analgesic or as a, um, as a dietary supplement for some other purpose, maybe memory. All of those are on the basis though of sustainability and accessibility. It's got to be sustainable and it's got to be accessible. And only when you've figured all this out can you develop the regulations to say, well, here's what we're going to say for this particular plant are the regulations that will apply. Here are the standards that a product is going to have to meet. All of this, all of this is pharmacocracy. It's eco-pharmacocracy. It's the study of biologically active natural products. So as we evolve the status of a traditional medicine, what are we doing? We're going from a knowledge-based system, in other words, what might be in a herbarium or, a, or in a book on, on the use of plant materials, to an experience-based system, which is the contemporary use of plant materials in various from, bought from various markets around the world, to an evidence-based system, one that's based on experimental data in the lab, looking at different plant species, distinguishing between different plant species to prove that the plant you're dealing with is the right plant. So this slide, what this slide is doing is showing you, sorry, I, let me go back here. Oops, how can I go back? What this slide is doing is showing you how different processing methods, and just follow the colors, different processing methods will give you different chemical profiles. Different chemical methods of extraction from the same root give you different chemical profiles. If you are a patient, your question is, which one of these is the best for me from a biological perspective, right? In other words, which processing method gives me the most reliable, consistent, biologically active material?
when you look at a product on a shelf in a pharmacy, in a GNC, in some place where they're selling dietary supplements, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, what's in a name? What's in a name? And as a pharmacist, you're going to be asked that a lot. How was that question about ginseng or neem? And Shakespeare had that answer, right? What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. What does that mean? Why is that relevant? So what it's about is this. It's not what the name is that's on the box that's important. You could put any name on that box, any name at all. It doesn't matter. So regulating the name that's on the box doesn't mean anything. It's about what's in the box. It's about what's in the box. It's about that biological response that is in the material, that is present in that product. So as patients, for us as patients, and we are all patients here, the name is not important. It's the content. It's what's in the box. That's our healthcare expectation. And so what we need to do is to think of natural products in healthcare from a patient-centered perspective in terms of Kuseka, that's supported by the natural product sciences, pharmacognosy, it's supported by the government regulation, and it's supported by industry and the suppliers doing their work in terms of quality control. But our focus is, got, is on getting something that has quality, safety, efficacy, consistency, and accessibility to the patient. That's the challenge. That's where the research is in pharmacocracy. This is about some of the background. It's now going into establishing pharmacopoeal standards. And one of the goals is to, is to put together pharmacopoeal standards that will overlap or even harmonize totally between the Chinese, the British, European, and the American pharmacopoeias that relate to traditional medicine quality control. So all of these techniques, all of these, some of the, 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 the macro and the micro, the, 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 the um, biological fingerprinting, various analytical systems, various types of, of chemometric analysis are all being used in terms of developing standards these days in order to establish a uniform standard for a traditional medicine. Together, that's a very important aspect of what modern pharmacognosy is about. We, we put together an article about this a few weeks ago. <clears throat> How about this gentleman? Here's, here he is out in the field with his, with his iPhone, and, and what's he doing? He's going to be analyzing his crop in the future, and he's going to be saying, well, I'm going to hook up the information that I'm getting at the moment uh, to various databases, and I'm going to see whether this is the optimum time for harvesting this material based on in-field analysis using some form of biosensor that's based on a biologically active natural product in that plant. Fanciful? Uh, yeah, a little bit. But real? It will be. It definitely will be. Because data, the cyber, is now so important in pharmacognosy. So very important. It's about data acquisition, analysis, and access to data access to data. Where is the data and how could we access it? Because everybody sits at a laptop computer, especially these days, and you access that data, you access that information. But for the most part, you have no idea where that information is in the world, where it's being held. You have no idea. It doesn't matter. It's just, it just so long as it appears on your screen, you're happy, right? You do a Google search, where does that data come from? Botanical identification. More and more we're relying on, on the background information that's, that's in these various data sets, particularly when it comes to medicinal plant DNA barcodes, 
that, that are being used now for the identification and, and certification of plant materials that are used for traditional medicines. We've got artificial intelligence and being used for spectral interpretation. You run a particular spectrum and you check it through AI with databases again that are existing in various places around the world for mass spectral data, for NMR data, etc. Extensions of that data lead to the elucidation of the structures of the natural products. Or they lead to what's called metabolite networking, which is how natural products in a plant material, in a bacterium, in a fungus, are interrelated biosynthetically. We're looking at automation and robotics in the laboratory. We've already got robotics in terms of doing automated analyses overnight. All right? That's automation with a certain amount of robotics. But what about when you have a robot that can take a plant, extract the plant, chromatograph, prepare the extract, chromatograph the extract, and then come up with a profile of the chemicals that are in that extract? Supposing you had that robot in your lab. It'll happen. It will happen. I'm, my guess is within 10 years at the most. It'll be there. You'll be able to buy that robot. Blockchain technology. I don't know how many of you know anything about blockchain technology. I can tell you that if it isn't already impacting your society, it will be soon. You will see it in foods. First, you will be able to tell through your smartphone what is the origin, what is the age, and what's the processing of that particular food. It's already in place. It's already working in certain countries around the world. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Here's my dream for, for an, a natural product system of databases. And, and again, talked about this with a colleague of mine in, in, in his group in Switzerland. So we're looking at genomic data, biochemical data, taxonomic data, traditional use data, biological data, and putting that all together, putting it all together. So that as you enter this, this portal, you have access to all of these data sets, wherever they are in the world. And one of the plans that we have is to link these databases together. Now, obviously, there's intellectual property issues involved, but we're trying our plan, our plan, our big plan, our grand plan is to, is to pull these databases together so that, that a single point of entry, you can say, okay, tell me the genomic data on um, Papaba somniferum, or give me all the biochemical data on Catharanthus roseus. I want to be able to do that, and I want to be able to do it on my smartphone. So what's blockchain technology? This sounds abstruse. It's a distributed ledgering system based on cryptographic annotations. What does that mean? What it means is that at each step in a pathway, from the field right through all the processing steps to the point of sale, is being monitored. And that that information is public information because it's providing an immutable, immutable means that it can't be changed, public record of each point of movement down that chain. That's why it's called a chain. And the block is the block of information that's being generated at each step, at each point of sale, at each point of analysis, at each point of analysis. So for example, so it gives you continuous management and verification. So, for example, if we, if we did it with grapes, right, or, or some other fruit, or we, we did it with traditional medicine, and we go through all the manufacturing process, and then we go to the point of sale, you with your smartphone can look at that QR code for that particular product, and you can get all that information, all those blocks of information for that product as it's been processed. So from traditional medicine quality control point of view, 
We're going from the field through the processing right through to the point of sale. And we're providing traceability and transparency. So, for example, as a pharmacist, you would be very, very interested in this because here's your ginseng products. It's got a QR tag on it. You scan it with your smartphone, and it tells you the history of that product. It tells you where it came from, when it was harvested. It tells you the processing steps. It tells you when it was packaged, when it was, when it was um, put on sale, how long it's been sitting on that shelf. So from a quality control perspective, this is going to be very important. As I said, first time you see it, it's going to come in in terms of foodstuffs. Then it's going to come in in terms of traditional medicines. So let's look at some future directions. We're going to look at expanded and integrated artificial intelligence data systems for the ethnopharmacology, for the chemistry, for the botany and the biology that's all associated with pharmacocracy. We're going to look at enhanced technology integration, handheld access to digitized data and remote sensing. I want everything on my smartphone. I do, including the remote sensing. And we'll, that's another whole lecture. More attention to the sustainability of medicinal plants and the knowledge that's associated with them. Not just the sourcing, but the knowledge. And for the good health of the society, the quality, safety, efficacy, consistency, and accessibility. Bringing in blockchain technology that looks at the traceability of the traditional medicine. You know where it comes from. You know how old it is. And Probably you'll know something about the analytical aspects as well. And importantly, coming out of that will be a revised way to look at a pharmacopoeia. A pharmacopoeia should be a living document, a living document because the field is changing so rapidly, and because the technologies that are being used to standardize all right, a particular entity the plant material or whatever it happens to be, are changing. Those standards are changing. The way that, 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 that materials are being analyzed are changing. And it's got to reflect quality of that material, not just the identity, not just saying, yeah, this is, um, this is Asa Direct Indica, but saying something about what the Asa Direct in contact is. Let's skip over this. So we're dreaming of a future. We're dreaming of a, a very high-tech, data-oriented future. And as George Bernard Shaw, a very famous English writer and philosopher, said, you see things and you say, why? But I dream things that never were. And I say, why not? But my favorite, of course, is my favorite beetle. John, the late John Lennon, who said, a dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together. So let's dream together, folks. Let's make this possible. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you. I hope that you found it interesting, and I hope you got questions. Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now.